Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online, and our newest co-sponsor, Cardamajigs.com, presenting Cubamajigs. These durable, scratch-resistant plastic cases are perfect for cubes, sideboards, and more, with new designs every Monday. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. We're back. Ruben Bressler. Hey, yeah, we are back. Welcome back to everybody. Thanks for uh, for waiting for us. We, we we did it, fam. Uh, there was a lot of travel, a lot of things going on. A lot of feelings. Some feelings. Yep. Some feelings. But, but we're good. We're back. Good. We're here. Fantastic. And it's time to talk about the split cards, of which there are 84 exactly. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week, or the week before, in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most luxuriant and letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top 10 warriors. Ruben? Well, y'all had two weeks to leave your comments, and the winner this time around is Goldstorm07, who writes, Norin the Wary deserves a nod due to his incredible longevity as a character, having flavor text from all the way back in Alpha via Jade Statue, and his own card's quirkiness, lending to a plethora of combos based on ETB triggers. Time Spiral finally gave cards to some of the most famous names in Old Magic, such as Jaya, Teferi, and Mistra, but humbler characters such as Norrin got their time as well, and in Norrin's case, a 2-1 that never dies found a lot of fans among the community. The card is so annoying. It's, it it's is true. a bizarre outlier. The fact that it is a warrior and not a coward, as I might have there anticipated, <clears throat> uh, it's interesting. And oh, by the way, uh, Planeswalker abilities are able to take care of Norn. Yeah. So, nice. You got to get creative. It's, it's Yeah, you got to be creative to get it off the battlefield, for sure. Well, those who don't know, Norn the Wary was a rare from Time Spiral. It's one red for a 2-1. So just one red for a 2-1. Uh-oh, here we go. Yeah. Legendary human warrior, not human coward, as it should be. When a player plays a spell or a creature attacks, remove Norin, wa Norin the Warrior from the game, return it to the to uh, the battlefield under its owner's control at end of turn. Goes very well with Soul Sisters type strategies where you can gain a lot of life from him. Uh, he gets even more insane in Commander where you can pair him with things like Confusion in the ranks. And, you know, it's just like, are you serious? <laughs> Norn doesn't do a lot of fair things, I feel. Uh, no, it's a it's a weird card. Uh, lots of, you know, grown worthy. Other strange cards, things like Genesis Chamber, I think it was a combo with. Um, I mean, yeah, it's a $5 it's a, card and a $20 foil. So. Exactly. And it's maintained that value because of that casual appeal mostly, mm -hmm. but it does have a little bit of competitive appeal as well. There yeah. you go. Well, congratulations to Goldstorm07. Get a hold of us via our social channels, uh, Reddit moderators. Find Aaron on Twitch if she hasn't blocked you there. But on Twitter, <laughs> she might have blocked you there. You never know. It's a whole, it's a, it's a block landscape out it's there. Blocks for everybody. It's fine. Yeah, that's right. Everybody gets a block. Uh, <laughs> but we will get you your fifty dollars gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. Thank you, Cool Stuff, for sponsoring that giveaway. Of course, my wonderful employer. They're pretty awesome. But that means we're going to talk about our top ten split cards. As mentioned, we have eighty four options, and uh, that's a thing. Absolutely. Um, this one was a lot of fun. Um, I had some that obviously I've used myself, and then there are some that I have uh, seen do things in various formats, and then uh, there are some that were were gone too soon. And then we have, I, 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 I in particular have some fun stories about some of these cards. Yeah, it was. This was a fun one. Um, particular shout out to the various sundry websites that uh, correctly align the split cards so that I don't have to read them all like this to see Scryfall. what I what I have to read. Scryfall do, uh, is great. Gatherer has now recently updated that you can oh. now read them in the in they are in their uh, uh, preferable state. Uh, although if you're playing against an opponent and they turn a card sideways, that's still. Uh, a glitch amongst the human being that you're playing against. Got it. I mean, and you still, you still have the really tiny pictures though on gather. Sure. Like, at this point, the card images on Scryfall versus gather are just like a, a complete joke, like an actual well, ridiculous yeah. joke. If you look at the full, like full scale of the Scryfall versus like the gatherer, which is like, sure. I mean, it's, it's, ridiculous and so for doing things like content and things things you want like high-res images of that stuff Absolutely. and i'm talking about people making not, their own not illegal play mats of the show we just like their stuff uh the difference yeah. absolutely is night and day which yeah. is one of the split cards by the way 
Nice. Well, there you go. Uh, there is one split card I here. Notice that I did not have on my list that I absolutely should have had on my list, but I'm, I'm also absolutely positive that Ruben does. So that's going to make me feel better. Okay. But that means that we're going to go ahead and get started here with our number 10. Aaron, what's your number 10? There was a time between Oath of the Gatewatch and Either Revolt where it was like the Wild West. We had cards like Brain in a Jar from Shadows Over Innistrad Block. We had Goblin Dark Dwellers. Mm -hmm. And then we had this cycle of expertises that allowed you to cast cards for free. All of these cards allowed you to cast cards effectively for free, which made the split cards free. Like you could just cast them. Um, so you had cards that were fine if you were casting one half or the other, but you really would normally have to jump through a lot of hoops to get them to work together. Well, now you didn't have to. Um, and right before Amonkhet came out, I believe um, they made a rules change where it no longer worked like that. And thank God, because you saw some nonsense. And one of the cards that was included in this nonsense uh, is my number 10, which is Beck and Call. Um, so Beck and Call is from Dragon's Maze. It's a sorcery. Uh, the Beck portion is uh, green and blue, and it's no loser. So, no? Wow. 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 <laughs> Wow. You that, was a try. Deep, that was a deep cut. You're you welcome. asked if we gotten it before I even got it. And then I got it. It was like, geez, that's wow. next level. going to be so mad at me. Okay. So wow. the back portion is whenever a creature enters the battlefield this turn, you may draw a card, which is fine. Um, the other portion is call. That says sorcery for colorless, a white and a blue. Put four white bird creature tokens with flying onto the battlefield. So if you do this at the same time, you're getting four one, one bird flyers and then drawing four cards, which is ridiculous. Now imagine doing it for free. Imagine doing like a rich cards expertise and just being like, whoop. <laughs> It's just absurd and uh, a lot of fun and definitely one of those cards that no one had really talked about before, but for that couple of months where all of these cards were legal, people tried. They really did. I was playing uh, Brain in a Jar uh, Beck and Call for a little while just because it was fun and hilarious. Yeah. And it abused a rule that was not a, a rule that had ever really been the focus. Yeah. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I believe that Bruce by the magic guy, a guy named Sean Abrams, yeah, I know him. Uh, is the guy that, that brought this beck and call brain in a jar deck to light. Uh, and I believe is primarily responsible for the rule change that occurred in April of 2017. Uh, that, that you can't do those shenanigans with the expertises mm -hmm. and uh, the cascade spells and stuff like that anymore. Yeah. I mean, he literally broke it basically. <laughs> and that's what it in that he broke the rules to the like the deck wasn't even good it just yeah. it broke a, a, a if you're rule. gonna call yourself bruce by the magic guy you gotta aim for the bleachers you know right. you can't just be i think that's the dream of every brewer to like be able to say that yeah. you know yeah i broke it so hard they changed the rules absolutely that's awesome yeah, yeah. really cool and, and that the deck was super fun to play it is really tough to fuse those two things together uh for its you know retail cost so yeah. being able to cheat the effect drawing four cards making four one ones still probably not good enough in modern but uh but it was certainly fun while it lasted wow well my 10 is higher on someone else's list which is going to happen a lot for this top cool. 10 just like last time ruben what's your number 10 my number 10 uh comes from the dissension set uh and at least half of this card well i think both halves of this card will appeal primarily to one miss aaron campbell um it, it didn't have a ton of competitive success, although uh, Chris McDaniel, a.k.a. Star Wars Kid, did bring it to the top four of Pro Tour Charleston, which was a team event. Uh, it's been a, a part of several loam decks and rock decks and gifts decks over its lifetime. Uh, and I remember fondly looking back and casting my own Crime and Punishment. Nice. So crime is three colorless white black sorcery. Put target creature or enchantment card from an opponent's graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And punishment is X black green sorcery. Destroy each artifact creature and enchantment with converted mana cost X. So a really weird card. And turns out, even though it's really niche, it fits a lot of those niches you want to be able to take out specifically that four casting cost artifact that your opponent has, but you don't want to clear away your own side of the board. You want to take out a whole swath of tokens, but you don't want to affect your own one drops or something along those lines. Or maybe your opponent has discarded a fire main angel or uh, had to get rid of an extra debtor's knell along the way. Well, the crime half is there to help you as well. 
Yeah, this is something I've tested before in modern specifically. Um, Dredge has sometimes flirted with engineered explosives, which uh, up until recently was super expensive. It was going for like 60 to 80 bucks a piece now. It's wow. still like a $30 card in some circles. And so for it was more of a budget option of sometimes you want to have just sort of a generic answer to things where, you know, if you're playing against Death Shadow or you're playing against humans, you know, a lot of times you can EE for one and they also happen to be playing cages. You can kill the cage and the champion of the parish or the cage, the spell bomb and the death shadow, um, a lot of these decks are running cards at the same casting cost. And so for people who couldn't afford those things, um, this was still an option that was in your colors and that would do mm -hmm. something similar if you wanted to try it. Well, uh, back in the day, uh, I actually got a little bit of notoriety uh, about an uh, Abzan deck that I was playing. So it was green, white, black. We didn't even have the word Abzan back then. But <laughs> back in my day, we didn't even know what things were called. Um, <clears throat> But we didn't have Abzans, but we did have Green, White, Black, and Lockstone Hierarch was the stuff, and Kakusho was there, and Yose was in there, and there was reanimator decks and stuff, and it was super duper awesome. Uh, and Crime and Punishment was was definitely a tool in the toolbox. It was mainly like a toolbox deck. It would run Glittering Wish, so it was like Glittering Wish control stuff, yeah. and so you can go and get that if you want. Yep. Uh, and it was really awesome. And uh, so there's an article out there that about a build that I ran, which was fun. And, uh, and yeah, so this is one of those classic cards, you know, from the the new split cards, which at the time were just like, oh. And then we had Gaze of Granite, which, you yeah. know, they, it, it, it seemed like we were kind of turning this into a thing that Black Green does. Even going back as far as Pernicious Steve, you could argue that this is just something that, you know, Golgari is very good at kind of just dealing with all of the things. Well, like, I'm ready for the Pernicious Steve that gets rid of Planeswalkers. Like, that's the reason they can't reprint it. Yeah, it's such a loophole, too. Like... like I get that they were trying to be exact with it, you know, but like, I also just want a pernicious deed, like to come back to magic. Yeah. I mean, well, maybe we'll get it in the upcoming, uh, uh modern horizons. horizons. Yeah. Modern horizons. Yeah. Or maybe we'll get it in. For delicious deed. I mean, they're giving yeah. us all these weird names, you know, let's go over and move here to number <laughs> nine. So mad at me. <clears throat> Jeez. Ruben, what's your number nine? You know, the the history of split cards is not particularly rife with uh, competitive pedigree. There aren't a lot that have really good tournament success. Um, in fact, I could only find maybe two or three split cards that had won Pro Tours um, or that were in championship decks of any kind, uh, much less in the hands of Kai Bude at the Pro Tour Chicago 2000, one of the most storied Pro Tours uh, in the history of Pro Tours based on all of the players that top aided. Uh, I believe there are six Hall of Famers and then a borderline wow. Hall of Famer as well wow. uh, in, in that top eight. And a four of in the main deck of uh, Kai's Rebels was Wax and Wayne. Neat. And I would never have, I, I, I don't think I would have just stumbled across that accidentally. But Wax and Wayne is a green and a white split card from the uh, Invasion expansion. It was an uncommon and one of the first split cards, the first generation. It is an instant on both halves. You can either have target creature get plus two, plus two until end of turn, or you can destroy target enchantment. Now, this was particularly relevant uh, against, um, there was a, a number of decks that depended specifically on enchantments. Most popular amongst these were the Fires of Yavi Maya decks, of which I believe there were five in that top eight, um, but could also take care of Rising Waters, um, which was also in that top eight. And then in games in which you don't need to wane an enchantment away, it's just a pump spell. And most of the decks that you were playing against that didn't have enchantments were just aggro decks. Typically the Mirror, uh, which the finals ended up being, a Rebel's Mirror. And so having a pump spell that cost one mana was able to just be a one mana removal spell most of the time. Very popular in that, uh, um, that format. And later uh, continued its lifespan uh, through Extended, Old Extended, um, in a deck called Three Deuce, which the name in convention for is... You know, old school magic decks have some difficult naming conventions, but this one was basically a zoo deck um, and being able to sort of hit pressure points at the right spots to be able to uh, knock the legs out from the other more powerful, objectively more powerful decks, things like tricks um, and using things like Dwarven Miner and Wax Wayne as its ability to sort of knock the legs out from those more powerful decks. So Wax Wayne has always been a, a go-to uh, for those kind of uh, uh, tricky, low-to-the-ground aggro decks. Just a good, honest card. So I went to Pro Tour Valencia uh, 10 years ago, because I'm an 
I'm old man, Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and on the morning of the actual event, not the Friday, but the Saturday, because it got canceled on day one, uh, there was no card that was hotter than Wax and Wayne. Because really? Enduring Ideal was a ah, thing. Right. It was a real wow. thing. And people had to figure out a way to stop them from killing them. And Waxwing was huge. I'm telling you that the dealers were offering five euros for a copy. It didn't matter. Wow, they were man. selling them for 10 euros. Like it was, this, this is the morning of the Pro Tour stuff that doesn't oh, happen yeah. anymore because of the way yeah. they structure it. But like back in the day, people were just like, wait a minute. Enduring Ideal is here. I'm going to get all my Waxwings. And like everybody was just looking for Waxwings and they just could not find them. And that wow. was a thing. Uh, so that's that's what I remember most about this card. This card is super. Sweet. Those destination pro tours and those floor prices that skyrocket are are something else. Yep, they are. They are a unique sort of sundry to those events. Uh, Aaron, what's your number nine? My number nine is the first of two hires on my list. Oh, I do. I have plenty of hires to go. <laughs> <clears throat> I got a hire coming up just with the next number. It's fine. Work. I have I have three hires on my list total. Uh, right. But by our powers combined, Aaron, we are equivalent to the amount of hires on Evan's list. Oh my God. Uh, he's got, he's got more hires than a Creed album. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. So my number nine, yes, my number nine is I a killed Aaron with that stupid <laughs> Christian rock joke. Excellent. My number nine is uh, a, a recent split card, and it was one of the aftermath cards, which of themselves are weird. Mm-hmm. Of themselves, got plenty of you know teeth gnashing whenever they change the frame. Everybody gets super upset about it or whatever. Uh, one of the cool aspects of this card is that uh, it's it's just one giant piece of artwork that they sliced into the two different cards, and yeah. this piece of artwork was also shown at the art show at Grand Prix Vegas which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this card started to see a bunch of play, particularly near the end of the format when people realized this was kind of very important for the mirror and whatnot. But insult to injury, the insult and the injury, I think it was supposed to be two, right? Insult to injury. Two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, the aftermath was supposed to be blank to blank. So dusk to dawn. Insult to injury was the card. It's insult is a red and two generic mana for a rare sorcery. Damage can't be prevented this turn. If a source you control would deal damage this turn, it deals double that damage instead. An injury as a Crank the head and I'll, oh, it'll rotate for me. Thank you. Uh, is a red and two generic mana for a sorcery that has aftermath, which means you can cast it only from your graveyard, then exile it. Injury deals two damage to target creature and two damage to target player. So the insult half was very, very important. And anything that tried to stop or prevent damage from happening was not going to happen. Uh, and as a result, this was a really fun kind of, it just kind of got you almost out of nowhere at times where you'd be like, oh, insult, blah, you're dead. You know, there you go. I was an unfortunate soul who once brought the turbo fog deck uh, <gasps> during that standard format to a tournament and i got housed by red deck with main deck insult Ooh, main oh, deck there's nice hazard it oh was that what? new horizons or new what, new perspectives new yeah okay yeah, yeah yeah it was it was uh i think that that was the nexus of fate deck uh, like the original, the, the OG, the first iteration of the Nexus of Fate deck, but I got in, I got insulted pretty badly, and I couldn't help but look across the table at this adorable little red spell and be like, you know what? First of all, I deserve that. Second of all, I think I'd rather you win this match anyway. Like if you <laughs> saw me coming from that far away, we're we're done here. Like game one, insult to injury, we're oh, good. Round one, yeah, game awesome. one, you're just like, no, yeah. it's all downhill from there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go here to number eight. And uh, as I mentioned, don't got one. My number eight is higher on somebody else's list. But that just means it's awesome. Ruben, what's your number eight? Hey, you just referenced a card called Dusk to Dawn. Well, guess what my number eight is? Nice. It's Dusk to Dawn. Oh, yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> I have this on my list, not for its competitive pedigree, but because I have this in one of my EDH decks. Um, one of my commander decks, and uh, it, it's very near and dear to my heart. So Dusk to Dawn is uh, a two-colorless white-white sorcery for Dusk, destroy all creatures with power three or greater, and Dawn is three-colorless white-white for the aftermath, which means you can cast it from your graveyard and then exile it. Return all creature cards with power two or less from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, this is one of the best cards in my Arcades the Strategist Elder Dragon Highlander decks, and I call it Elder Dragon Highlander because Arcades is himself an elder dragon. Um, 
destroy all creatures with power three or greater is quite good when your deck is full of walls and defenders. But let me tell you something. Dawn is even better when you're drawing nine, ten cards that have died over the course of the game. Wow. It is a spectacular feeling um, and uh, just a lovely card, and I'm, I'm super happy with it. And the movie's great. Dust it on. Oh my God. Robert Rodriguez, uh, Quentin Tarantino, one of the best. Yep. I don't care who you are. I don't, I'm not normally into girls. But let me tell you, that scene with Salma Hayek and the, the table. Oh my God. I even snake? have some conflicting feelings. <laughs> du- from, du- du- from dusk to dawn, I, the rest of this podcast is about from dusk to dawn. So listen, <laughs> this, this movie is a seminal piece of a uh, formative piece in my love of movies because it's not, it's, obje- it's not a good movie. The first half is but just absolutely brilliant. Like it's right, absolutely it's fun. Brilliant. And then the second half is a totally different movie. Yeah. It's there's there is no like there's no movie I can think of that has like a hard gear change quite like that. Mm-hmm. And Clooney has never been sexier. Like, you know, there are a lot of women who like clean cut Clooney. Like they like ER Clooney. You know, right. they want Clooney who's gonna wear a cardigan and give him cocoa. Oh no. I like I bad boy, Canada. bad boy hanging with Harvey Keitel in the RV. <laughs> yes. Juliet Lewis going nuts. Yeah. I got five little friends. They can all run a lot faster than you can. Yeah. Holding up the gun. It's fantastic. Yep. And of course, magic celebrity Danny Trejo is in that movie. Right? He's yeah. Great. Razor Charlie, I think he was. Yeah. Right. Very right. nice. Turn three Gigantosaurus. <laughs> Sorry, we turned into a film podcast there for a second. Aaron, yeah, sure. what's number eight? So my number eight, speaking of film, uh, this is, uh, that was a bad segue, but let's try it. Um, So this is a card that people predicted was going to be a hit in modern, specifically with the Death Shadow decks, um, because this seemed to be like something you really wanted. Um, And unfortunately, you know, people tried it and it really didn't hold a lot of water, but it was fun while it lasted. Uh, My number eight is Claim to Fame. Movies, Mm. fame. Yeah. Uh Gotta try it. Got it. Gotcha. Um, so this is from Our De- Devastation. It's a uh, claim is a sorcery. It costs one black. Uh, return target creature card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. I'm listening. Um, and then fame is also a sorcery, one in a red uh, with aftermath. Target creature gets plus two plus oh and gains haste until end of turn. Most Death Shadow decks are Grixes. That is sort of the flavor to beat in modern. And so um, they don't run very many creatures. You know, you run a couple of Gurmags, maybe a Tassiger, and you run your Death Shadows. And so if someone happens to deal with your Death Shadows, not only can you bring it back because they only cost one, but give it two oh in haste. That's amazing. And so um, I remember shortly after this card came out, there were people testing it at various PPTQs. And it never really you know took off but it was cute and i appreciated that people tried and i thought it was fun like it's if i recall this was like very high on my top 10 amonkhet cards list i thought Mm -hmm. this was gonna break stuff in half and turns out you just play snapcaster mage instead because why would you ever do anything why why would you not play snaps (laughs) he's just so good and just bolt them again it's fine but yeah i was i was definitely on the claim to fame train as well i thought that this card was going to be bananas and, and it never really got there in the in the shells that we thought that it might but it is one of those cards that has upside as they print more stuff this is a card that I would not be surprised if it accidentally got broken at some point in the next, you know, two, three, five years. I mean, yeah. because on on its face, you're able to say things like, well, look, it will, it will, you know, go get the Snapcaster back. It'll get a Snapcaster and a Death Shadow and give it a haste. And, and it has it has uh, uh, an effect from the graveyard by itself. So right. think Thought Scour or Dredging will be able to, it, it's not alone. You don't need a piece to make it work from that point. So, you know, maybe it's not the uh, end of the line for claim to fame as long as they keep printing creatures and, and wizards has obviously shown that they the creatures matter yeah. you know people are going to be looking at that one two converted mana cost spot and being like hmm, hmm, okay. <laughs> i mean it's it's going to be there and yeah. that's just one of those that can turn into a chase uncommon out of nowhere yeah uh, because it does that stuff yeah. that said let's move on here to number seven ruben what's your number seven uh my number seven and my number six are two of my hires. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right, Aaron, uh, do you have number seven for us? My number seven is my last hire for the night. So. Oh, my God. I'm going to carry this whole thing by myself. <laughs> Look, Good. We're you, letting you have a chance. I was just going to say, you don't have much opportunity to get off the right. bench. But you know what? We're going to call in the closer for you here at number seven. All right, here we go. Here we go. Well, look, my number seven is a, uh, a classic at this point uh, from Dissension was originally showed up. Dissension was sweet. Uh, it had all of the uh, Rakdos cards in it, which was sweet. Uh, but for this one and for Dissension, they had the split cards that had one guild on one side, one guild on the other side. Uh, this card saw a ton, a ton of play. It was super, super sweet. Uh, both both halves are interesting. 
kind of, which is was always nice because you could either rise or you could fall. Yep. Because rise is a black and blue mana for a uncommon sorcery that says return target creature card in a graveyard and target creature in play to their owner's hands. So I'll rebuy a bob and bouncer or whatever. Right. Or there will be fall for red and a black, which is target player. It's, a, again, a common sorcery. Target player reveals two cards at random from their hand, then discards each non-land card revealed this way. And oftentimes, particularly late in the game, that was just they discarded their last two cards, and that's brutal. Yep. So the flexibility of this card is unreal, and the Grixis decks were able to take full advantage of both halves doing really interesting things the entire time. Yeah, I really like Rise Fall a lot. It, it sort of... Uh, never really broke its way. There were so many decks that were possible that this this card didn't really have any uh, uh, huge impact during its life in Standard or Old Extended. Um, it did occasionally pop back up in Modern because the Jund decks really liked having access to Rise for mm -hmm. the Mirror. And Bloodbright Elf could cascade into the fall side just in case you needed it against some of the, the mid-rangey kind of control decks. So Rise Fall was actually a, a good tool in the, the heyday of, of Bloodbraid Jund um, when it was like 25% of the field uh, back um, in those days. Back when they, before they changed the, the rules about split cards where Bloodbraid Elf could actually cast. No, it could still cast either half. It just couldn't cast both. Oh, I see. Well, okay, so they were fusing. It was the fuse problem, right? Right. That was a fuse problem. Was a Dissension fuse problem. didn't have fuse. You could only right. fuse, you could only play both halves uh, if the card had fuse to begin with. This right. one didn't have that problem. It was just, they were typically using it for the rise half to be able to bounce mm -hmm. your opponent's sprouting Thrynax and rebuy your Bloodbraid Elf or whatever. Um, but occasionally you'd want to, uh, off of a Bloodbraid Elf, if you flipped it, then you could theoretically cast the fall. Hmm. Let's move on here to number six which Ruben doesn't have one. Right. Aaron, do you have a number six? I do. So my number six was a staple of the zombies list in Amonkhet. Uh, I believe this was in Jerry Thompson's uh, Pro Tour winning deck. Feel free to correct me, Ruben. You're the specialist on that. But um, this was a really good card in the zombies deck. It was a, it was a form of removal um, that doubled as a way to make more zombies. Very efficient. Um, and number six is Never to Return. Mm. Um, so Never to Return is from Amonkhet. It's a sorcery, a colorless and two black. It says destroy target creature or planeswalker, which by itself is fine. Um, the second part is Return, which is also a sorcery, three and a black. Um, with Aftermath, you can exile a target card from a graveyard and create a two, <laughs> two black zombie creature token. Now, remember, it doesn't matter what you exile to get a zombie. It can be a spell, it can be a land, it can be whatever. And so we were in a format with Torrential Gear Hope. We were in a format with a lot of other zombies, other Aftermath cards. You know, there were a lot of targets that were worth eating with that particular card. Or if you just felt like being particularly vengeful, you know, if you wanted to, you you know, destroy a certain creature and then, or Planeswalker, and you wanted to get that same creature gods were in the format. Um, this was a really neat way to deal with that too. And you got a 2-2 two -two for your trouble, which is what exactly what you wanted to be doing if you were playing zombies. So, you know, as I said before, you know, when you are finding answers for your deck, you want to be playing answers that line up with your with what you're already doing. So if you're playing like mono white death and taxes and you need graveyard hate, you probably want to be con playing containment priest because you're already playing white bears. And so, you know, if the whole goal is to deal with graveyards or to play a zombie deck and, and your thing makes zombies, that's what you want to be using. And so lines up really well, had a lot of fun with it and uh, just, just cool card. This was my number eight. Because okay. I love me a never to return a hero's yeah. downfall with upside. Yeah. Uh, there was just, and yeah, it's slower, yada, yada. But like, there's a ton of play in the aftermath cards. I kind of mm -hmm. wish they would have went over it a little better because I think it's, I, I love the idea of sticking two spells onto one card. We've done it with split cards, we've done the aftermath cards. Our entire top 10 is about this fact. It's yeah. just, it's really fun and interesting. Uh, and also when you're playing and there's people who just does that, like, you know, oh, turns to the side you don't, you don't want to I realize that I'm horribly biased here, but uh -oh. um, I feel like they were very timid when it came to, the, to these cards. Like, I feel like yeah. they realized the potential for, like, brokenness, and, and that's why a lot of these felt so underpowered. Like, right. It's ironic, considering that these cards were in the same standard format as energy. Right. <laughs> So, not wrong. Uh, I can definitely see where anything that is played twice or played from the graveyard uh, re creates those recurring play patterns where, like, you just keep seeing the same right. thing over and over again. Yeah, it's a little bit less of a problem with this than, say, Flashback mm -hmm. um, or with um, uh, things like Bloodgast, and you get the same effect over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, this was a, a really popular piece, and, and this one was a real mid-range player's mid-range card mm -hmm. because... 
destroying a card at sorcery speed for three mana, yeah, that's good, but it's almost never game breaking. I mean, we had Ruinous Path, and that didn't break anything either. No. Uh, and then the flashback of removing a card, getting a tutu is like pretty average, but you know what? In a deck full of answers, this one had all you need is a tutu to be able to just finish the game. Um, and so this was a, a really popular part uh, card in those black green, uh, particularly those constrictor builds. Hmm. Uh, leaned on this as a good way to deal with uh, planeswalkers. Yeah, and again, that whole uh, the uh, the six mana. What was that guy? that got the gear Hulk again. The Verderus. Well, there was Verderus. Was the torrential Nasha? torrential gear Hulk? That thing. The getting right. those stupid spells out. Oh, so it couldn't play Vraska's oh, yeah, Contempt sure. twice. Oh, yes, yeah. that was super duper important. That said, uh, we also I, I again have the uh, have a Almanket card, an aftermath card, as my number six. Uh, this one, this one's funny to me because it felt like all like one day everyone was just like, wait a minute, this card is amazing. Really? It's like it went from zero play into just every single build of those vehicle artifact aggro red black aggro things yep. cut to ribbons. Mm -hmm. That's what it did to you because it was yep. amazing. <laughs> A red and a generic mana is a rare sorcery for a cut is a rare uh, <laughs> cut is a red and generic mana for a rare sorcery that deals four damage to our creature. God help me. Uh, ribbons is black, black and X sorcery aftermath casting from your graveyard and exile it. Each opponent loses X life. So we got rid of the blockers and killed them later whenever you got around to it. And if you had multiples and you had six mana and they're at eight, you just four you go. OK, four you, you're dead. Like and that happened a lot. This it always took you awesome. by surprise. Every time I died to it, I forgot that it had happened. I forgot mm -hmm. it was in the graveyard. And, you know, it gave these decks something to do. You know, a lot of these aggressive decks, you know, they empty their hand very quickly. You know, you're relying on these top decks and you need kind of those mana sinks, whether it be whether it be a land that you can pour mana into and make a creature or whether it be a land like Kessig Wolf Run, whether it be, you know, just, just a god that you can pour mana into like Hazaret and like fling things at people. You know, that's really, I think, what pushes a good aggressive deck over the top is when you have something to do with your mana just in case you know your, your draws aren't there aren't there right. and so this was a fun thing where sometimes you would just have these games where you're not drawing anything but you're like oh one two three four five <laughs> die and, <laughs> um, and so it's just something you can do and just a really a really brilliant design yeah this one in particular again this was like i just felt like somebody was just like wait a minute i'm gonna play one of this in the main and like two in the sideboard and just start to destroy people yep it was it was fantastic because bowman courier made you discard it which was who cares whatever right exactly one of the few cards that you didn't mind if you got rid of it particularly against control decks you needed yeah. a way to get rid of it right um anytime pay two mana deal four damage to a creature shows up be it mizium mortars be it this be it lava coil uh it becomes a player in standard at some point um, and this is no different. Saw play in not just the Rakdos aggro decks and the Martyr Vehicles decks, but uh, there was like the Teamer Energy Splash Black for Scarab God decks. Yep. It began running this and uh, like two copies of this to just have access to when you got had a bunch of energy and some Aether Hubs and you could just finish people off for 15 at the end of the game. Uh, it was This was definitely a, oh, right, my creature died on turn two. I completely forgot about yep. that, and now I'm dead to that lava coil that's in your graveyard this was my number seven nice nice yeah well there you go so that was your number seven what we just missed on that one uh move here to number five and uh it's gonna be a minute before uh i get to talk again at least bring up things again uh, as my number five and my number four are wow. higher on someone else's list Aww. and we're not even done we ain't oh. done with hires y'all love it Shoot. that said room watch number five my number five is from a set that didn't have a ton of split cards. In fact, there were only three split cards in Planar Chaos, and they were all red. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've all had their time in the sun, actually. Dead Gone mm -hmm. has been a, a sideboard card, in an, or even a, a, sometimes a main deck card in a number of older formats uh, and seen some play in Pauper as well. Rough and Tumble has seen play in sideboards, particularly Delver sideboards because the rough half deals two damage to each creature without flying. And then, of course, there's the rare of that sort of mini cycle, which is Boom Bust. Boom Bust is a... Uh, boom is a colorless and a red for a rare from Planar Chaos. Destroy target land you control and target land you don't control. And then Bust is destroy all lands for six mana. Um, 
not really that competitive, honestly. I mean, it's it's had its own archetype. Boom Bust Zoo was quite popular. As we mentioned, they recently changed the rules to how split cards uh, were cast. But previous to that, you could have something like a Bloodbraid Elf cascade into a Boom Bust. And even though the Boom is the quote-unquote castable half, the Bust is the one that you can choose to cast. Yep. So you could play your 3-2 unblockable and, oh, by the way, destroy all lands. This was my number nine. Um, this was the card that um, people really were looking forward to breaking with the expertise cycle. I remember I was playing in a side event. I, I think, no, I was playing in a main event at a GP. And I remember I was in like the, the five and two-ish bracket and I'm feeling really good about myself. And all of a sudden I'm running into what appears to be a Delver deck. And all of a sudden I start seeing there's thought scours happening. I see that in the graveyard and then they go Dark Dwellers. And I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I called a judge over and they're like, yep. And all my stuff was gone. And I was like, are you serious? And like, this was the payoff for that style of deck. This was, you know, beck and call was cute, but this is really like Carrie Zev's expertise, Yehani's expertise, you know, Baral's expertise. This was the payoff. This was really, I think the pinnacle in modern, at least this was like, I think the best that you could have been doing with that was just free boom bus. Like, Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. And it was kind of nuts. And during standard, you know, paying six mana for an Armageddon, we hadn't had an Armageddon in, in a no. long time at this point. And even for two mana, you could target your own flagstones of Trocare at the time, or you yeah. could target your own land that could then sacrifice to go get another land, either a Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse was uh, in the standard at the time, or a traditional fetch land. Yeah, I mean, the, the Flagstones play was huge back in yeah. the day. Like, that was super heavily played. Um, <clears throat> Boom Bust is the one card that I, I was saying earlier that I wish I had put on my list, but I knew that you had, which was that one, because I, for some reason, just passed right over it. Um, right. But Boom Bust is absolutely terrific, and it's it went into all those weird Cascade decks, which got things weird. The, the Goblin Dark Dweller thing, which was fun. Um, I don't know about fun. Powerful. Fun, depending on whose seat you're in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're playing it. Woo. That sounds, sounds amazing. Well, Aaron, <clears> I'm <throat> surprised you had enough lands in play to care. <laughs> I was playing Modern Ad Nauseam. I didn't oh, have enough sure. mana rocks. Fair. <laughs> Not nice. enough Pentad Prisms out at the time. Fair enough. All right. Aaron, what's number five? My number five is a card that I personally was very excited about. You know, I talked about my number eight in Claim of Fame and ha Claim to Fame and how the Death Shadow folks were really excited to test that one out. And the modern dredge players were particularly excited by number five because uh, combo in particular is very difficult for us because all we can really do is just try to kill you before you combo off. And a lot of times when you're facing something like Storm or Ad Nauseum, um, a lot of times they're just one turn faster or they have ways to sort of prolong their life. And we don't really have any way to, uh, you know, interact with you unless we're doing something like Thought Seize or Raven's Crime. Um, so this gave us a really nice way to interact with those combo decks and also wasn't entirely dead, no pun intended, um, if we had it sitting in our hand or our graveyard. Uh, my number five is Driven to Despair. Um, so Driven to Despair is from Hour of Devastation. The first half is Driven, which is a sorcery for one and a green. Uh, until end of turn, creatures you control gain trample, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So like, you'll take it and maybe you'll even dredge some things. It'll be fine. Push some damage through, whatever. But despair is really what we were here for. So the aftermath portion is one in a black uh, until end of turn creatures you control gain menace. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card. So not only, you know, you really need to be applying pressure and disruption. And this card really allows you to do that. If you didn't have a thought season your opening hand, if you weren't on the Raven's Crime plan, what are you going to do against Storm? Yeah, you can swing in for 12 and then they'll kill you next turn. And so this was a way to hit you for 12, put a really big dent in your life total, and maybe make you discard two or three cards. And if you needed all those cards to win, which a lot of these decks need that critical hand to do it, this was a really nice crimp in your plan. And so really fun card. There are still some people who feel very strongly about it. It didn't really last, mostly because the decks that we wanted this against aren't really much of a thing anymore. But if we do find ourselves in metagames where combo is very popular, you'll find people siding these back in and it gets the job done. Nice. nice. Yeah, I, I appreciate I, the... Go ahead. <clears throat> I was going to say, I've definitely cast my fair share of this in Limited, and I think there was a brief time where I played this in Constructed, uh, where I just cast both halves back-to-back. -back. Uh, that's pretty back-breaking as well, even if you just have two or three creatures on the board, draw three cards, make your opponent discard three cards. That's plenty for four mana. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, and the the idea that um, I I usually really dislike when they put keywords, but they don't put the you know the reminder text. But it's kind of cool when they use it on the rares, you know. Yeah. It's kind of neat. Um, but the uh, the versus system game <clears throat> does this all the time, like all the time, even with their brand new mechanics in their new release. They'll have a new mechanic and they'll just put it out there, and they yeah. won't tell you what it does at all. And I'm just sure. like, <sighs> it just it drives me nuts. Anyway. Uh, let's see. Let's go here to number four. I still don't have one. Ruben, watch your number four. It's pretty tough to finagle the text box on those aftermath cards when you've got a lot of text like uh, like the the driven. Um, my number four is uh, a recent addition to the long history of split cards, uh, specifically from the Guilds of Ravnica expansion, um, and has only recently gotten uh, most of the love that it rightfully deserves. I remember we had a follower of this here program who was the biggest uh, acolyte of this card, and I forget exactly who it was, but I think commented to each of us specifically and was like, you all, expansion explosion is the truth. Why aren't you focusing on expansion explosion? It, it's, it's Sphinx's revelation. We were like, it's not Sphinx's revelation. And they were like, no, it's Sphinx's revelation. And we were like, but it's, but gaining life is better than a fireball. That's a, that's a word that we all, that's a thing we that's all said. That's um, a thing we said. And also we four is a lot more than three. And also we didn't know about wilderness reclamation yet. So I think that we're forgiven a little bit. Um, but yeah, my number four is expansion explosion. So expansion is uh, red blue hybrid red blue hybrid instant copy target instant or sorcery spells converted mana cost four or less you may choose new cards for the or targets for the copy so that's fun in counter spell battles uh, against red decks you can use your expansion to copy their burn spell to kill off one of their creatures on the board uh, you can copy of Vraska's contempt to be able to deal with things on the other side of the table as well but the big selling point is explosion which is X blue blue red red instant. Explosion deals X damage to any target, and target player draws X cards. There have been a number of games with, even without Wilderness Reclamation, just regular old Jeskai control, where this can get out of hand very quickly and becomes a Sphinx's Revelation, because the first one is for three, and so it gets you a little bit of value, then the next one's for five, and by the end of it, you're decking your opponent for 15. So it's, yeah, it's, it just uh, comes out of nowhere. Like, Wilderness Reclamation does, makes this a completely unfair experience. Absolutely. Yeah, this was my once, number five. Yeah, once you have eight lands and a, and you untap with a Reclamation, this becomes play your ninth land, deal 14, draw 14 if you want it to be during your end step, which is a ludicrous nice. proposition. It's just yeah. bananas. Um, the first time I had this played against me, it was just like the jaw dropping. Oh my God, this card is amazing. <laughs> Cause I've Raskas contempt something to theirs and they were like, okay, I'll get one too. Get rid of your whatever. And I'm like, what? I remember I seeing the community reaction to it because part of our job is to sort of keep up with what's happening around us. And so I remember we had done, you know, our, our, our videos, we had, we had ruled, we, we kind of rated this card, how we thought it was going to be. And I just remember seeing the reactions on Twitter, like after the set had actually come out and seeing people testing it and seeing people take it to events and seeing the tweets come in of like, this card's the truth, this card's the truth, this card's the truth. And I was like, oh, oh. And so it was really great to watch the tide turn on that one. Yeah, this this card I in particular, I think, you know, sort of snuck up on a lot of people in a very good way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and snuck up on us and whoever that viewer was, nameless viewer that I forget, not nameless, but name, name that I forget, I can't remember. you had this one right. Very nice, very nice. Aaron, what's your number four? I loved this card in standard. I don't play standard very often, but uh, in the, the previous standard, I played Approach of the Second Sun and I loved it so much. And one of the reasons why I loved it was this card in particular. And uh, this card has gained new life uh, in my EDH decks, uh, specifically my Locust God EDH decks, because um, sometimes you just need a wheel. Uh, my number four is Commit to Memory. Um, so Commit to Memory is from Amonkhet. The first half is Commit, it's an instant three in a blue, uh, put target spell or non-land permanent into its owner's library second from the top. Uh, which again is really handy, um, you know, planeswalkers, instant sorceries. Uh, we had a lot of graveyard things in the format. Uh, memory is the other half, which is a sorcery, four colorless and two blue with aftermath. Uh, each player shuffles their hand in graveyard into their library, then draws seven cards. You have this weird form of graveyard hate of just shuffle your entire stuff together, draw seven cards. If you're trying to play Approach of the Second Sun, you need to find your son. There you go. Um, or if you're playing Locust God and you need to have a wheel effect, you know, you get like sort of a, a faux counter spell and then all of a sudden you got Locust God out and whee, 
sweet. So I have had a lot of fun with this card. Um, and it was, it was a hit for me in standard and now I get to use it in EDH and everything's fine. I love the phrase target spell or non-land permanent. I think that's yes. really sweet. It's a really cool phrase. <clears throat> and it gives such flexibility to things, you know, yeah. like d I I'm excited about, I think they are one day going to say destroy target spell and Oof. they'll say destroy target spell or creature hmm. on a card. And I think that would be amazing. Um, yeah. Destroy target spell is, is weird phraseology, but remember uh, when like destroy target player was like unheard of yeah, and crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're they, right. They do that now. I'm just saying it's pretty cool. Uh, Commit to Memory, though, was a fantastic card. Saw an infinite amount of play um, yep. and was sort of one of the go-to counterspells, even though it was four mana. And even though it's yep. not really a counterspell, it kind of always felt like one. So yeah, that was neat. It was um, also the card you wanted to open in Pack War the most out of that set because it had 10 converted mana cost. Nice. Nice. You always win those. All right, so that was our number four. You know, I have one, but I got a number three. Oh, don't hello. worry, I don't have a number two. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't, you know, that is mine. Right. Well, look, everyone's talking about these, you know, these newfangled spells. Oh. And I, I like, no, no, no. Actually, I like me, I like me some newfangled, as oh, it turns okay. out. Um, you don't have to go too far in the... Uh, in guilds of Ravnica to see some awesome split cards. Like they, I think wizards was like, okay, we're seriously going to make some awesome split cards yeah, now. And they did it. And one of the best, one of the most powerful, one of the coolest, one of the most Golgari cards is find and finality. I love find and finality. Um, the card is super, super powerful. Find is two Golgari mana. That's green, black hybrid, green, black hybrid, a rare sorcery. Return up to two creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. And finality is a green, black, and four generic mana for a rare sorcery that says you may put two plus one plus one counters on a creature you control. Then all creatures get minus four, minus four until end of turn. Uh, huge backbreaking moments with this card. Uh, this is the type of card that is just the ultimate mid range attrition. I'm just, I'm just grinding you out. I'm just grinding you out. Out. Oh, you finally killed my Ravnus Chupacabra. Okay, cool. I'll get it back and a Wild Growth Walker and blah, blah, blah. Let's keep this, you know, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Yep. Fine Finality gives you that type of, you know, long game approach that you want from the Golgari deck. And I think they did a terrific job on both halves. Both of them feel perfect in terms of what black should do, what green should do, what they should they do together, how you're clear on the board and you're still able to swing with what's left, which is cool too. Um, there's just, there's no downside in my opinion to Fine Finality, which makes it one of the best they've ever made. Yeah, really yeah. interesting uh, how they were able to make these split cards, particularly the ones that are trying to do both things, the left sides, the smaller effects. Mm -hmm. What is an effect that we can cast for black, black? What's an effect that we can cast for green, green? What's an effect that we can cast for black, green? And have that spell make sense within yeah. the color pie. And they did a wonderful job with all of them, I thought. Yeah. Um, and it, it, that's a tough thing to do with 10 cards, particularly the rares, uh, and make it worth your while. And then, of course, finality uh, um, being the combination thereof. It couldn't be mono black. It couldn't be mono green. It had to be the two abilities together. Uh, Fine finality is a big popular piece, of course, in the black green Typically now splashing blue for Hydroid Crisis decks um, that are just mid-range all day, every day. Uh, Find being a sort of modified divination. Really fabulous spell, really powerful, and gives that deck something that it has nowhere else, which is board control, that is uh, um, a, a, a mass board sweeper. Uh, this was my number seven. Yeah, my first taste of this card. So right when uh, Guilds of Ravnica came out, some people were toying with the idea of a gruesome menagerie deck, which of course I was one of them. And so um, this was a card that was very good in that deck because you didn't care if your things died um, because you would just bring them back with gruesome menagerie. And so when you don't care about things like that, or you could just make one of your things bigger and just sort of get there with that strategy. Or if your gruesome menageries weren't getting off, like they were being countered or, or being you know messed with somehow, you know duress or what have you, you could play this grindy game of, okay, fine, I'll just find these two creatures, pay them for their casting cost and grind you out that way. So, you know, Golgari having the ability to pivot from really broken things to having to, if you want to play fair, we'll play fair. And so I like that ability to, uh, to do that, depending on how things are going. Nice. All right, Ruben, what's your number three? My number three is a personal favorite of mine. It's one of the cards that brought me back to competitive magic during the original Ravnica block. It's also from Dissension. We have a lot of Dissension representation uh, going on. Another of those, un the uncommon cycle of two guilds, uh, uh, each getting half of the split card. Um, 
I'm not sure I've ever cast the right half of this. Um, uh, it's, it's always been in Mardu decks, even though the right half is a ghoul card. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm just so in love with the hit half of Hit Run uh, that I had to make mention of it in the top 10. Very Ruben, on brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hit is a colorless, a black and a red instant. Target player sacrifices an artifact or creature. Hit deals damage to that player equal to that permanent's converted mana cost. Run is three colorless, red, green instant. Attacking creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn for each other attacking creature. So if you were attacking with five tokens, they would each get plus four, plus oh until end of turn. Uh, but the hit half is the real selling point here for me. Um, I loved it so much that I would play four copies of Hit and Run in my Dark Confidant decks. So confident I was in Hit Run that when I could cast it that I would just still win the game, uh, I was willing to take eight damage. Oh, and oh, by the way, uh, so was Tomoharu Saito, who won Pro Tour Charleston with uh, Tomohiro Kaji and Shoti Yasuoka with four copies of Dark Confidant and four copies of Hit Run in his uh, Mardu aggro deck as well. Greatness at any cost. That's right. Really? And usually that cost is eight. That cost, but I, in fact, ran Dark Confidant with Greater Gargadon, and that's nine, oh, y'all. Sure. Nine. That's ten, isn't it? <clears throat> is it ten? Nine? Is it ten or is it nine? Might be nine. Might I've be nine. definitely seen people in vintage take uh, fifteen from their Emrakul. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, or or twelve from their Blightsteel. Oh, all right. I love, I love to tell the story about the young man at Eternal Extravaganza who was playing Bug and he was facing Dredge and he had opened up with two Leyline of the Voids. The Dredge player was effectively dead in the water. Um, the Leyline player got cocky and played two Bobs and then inevitably died to double ley line flips. And it was the best, Jeez. like, I clipped that. The other two ley lines. That that's... one is going in my Christmas cards every year, but that wow. was just an amazing moment. Fantastic. Yeah, that's yeah. terrific. All right, Aaron, what's number three? So I'm not known for being much of a control player. I, I, I can do a mid-range strategy. I can do a broken strategy. I'm not really an aggro player. Am I doing it right? Aggro? Aggro. 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 Okay, <laughs> I say aggro funny, I'm sorry, but, um, but you know, sometimes I can do a control deck. I, I like control decks. I played Esper Dragons, and the thing that really attracts me to control decks is I like when they have a diverse array of answers. I don't like control decks when it's just 40 kill spells. I don't like control decks when it's just 40 counter spells. I like tools. I like different shapes, different sizes. <laughs> wow. Good gosh. That just... You know, you know, like, I, I know I like you like your tools in different shapes and like, sizes. We get it. We understand. <laughs> I'm just saying, as I like, I appreciate control decks that have diversity of answers. And so, uh, one of the things that really attracted me to good old Jeskai control back in the days of Return of Ravnica was the many ways it had to deal with things. And in particular, my number three, which is turn and burn. Uh, so, turn and burn is from Dragon's Maze. Uh, the turn portion is an instant, two colorless and a blue. Target creature loses all abilities and becomes a zero one red weird until end of turn. Um, and then you have burn, which is the other half which is instant one in a red burn deals two damage to target creature or player this is nice like the ability to take something that would normally have indestructible regenerates to be really really big and reduce it to an 01 that could very well just die on its own like it makes a neat little combat trick okay fine your 01 dies to anything um and then you could also just burn something else out so make this an 01 burn that thing this is beautiful. Like it's things like this that make me, somebody who doesn't normally play control, want to play control because it's so efficient and clean and mwah, I love and sometimes it. Sometimes you need long answers and sometimes, you know, <laughs> the short answers are okay too. You know, they don't, there's nothing wrong with them. They just don't yeah, it's last. About, it's about having the right answer at the right time. <clears throat> exactly. Right. Know how to use your answers. All right. Yeah. Um, this was my number four. This was one of my favorite cards out of Dragon's Maze. Like this was one they previewed, I think, relatively early in terms of show off fuse or whatever. And I was like, oh, my God, this set's going to be amazing. This card looks super sweet. I love what it's doing on both halves of it. I can kill anything no matter what it is for five mana. That's terrific. And that's this is literally one of the best cards in the whole set because there's not a whole lot going on. Yeah. Dragon's Maze. It's kind of sad. That's it. Moving here to number two. My number one of my num my number two is somebody's number one. Oh boy! Because I ain't got one. Pretty sure it's my, my number two <laughs> is also somebody's number one. What? Uh -huh, that's crazy. Which means Aaron, do you have a number two? 
I sure do. Uh, so back to Dragon's Maze, again, just having really efficient answers to things. You know, I appreciate that. And this was a card that I really, really love. You know, Turn and Burn is great, but I am a dyed in the wool black mage. I love my black spells. I love my kill spells. And more importantly, I love clever ways to deal with things. Um, you know, we were in a format where Hexproof was kind of a thing for a little while, which was really, really annoying. Um, you know, I was playing sort of the Esper control kind of mid brain strategies. I also played Esper humans for a little while, which was hilarious. Um, and again, yeah, this is just a really neat answer, very versatile answer to things. Um, and number two is far and away. Uh, far and away, uh, the first half is far. It's an instant, one in a blue. Return a creature to its owner's hand. Fine, perfectly fine. Uh, the other half is away, which is an instant two in a black. Target player sacrifices a creature. Uh, one of the ways to get around hexproof is by playing multiple creatures. Um, you know, or if you're just playing any sort of strategy. You know, one of the reasons why Colney Garden sees play is because if you pair that with you know a Bogle or even a Titan, your Liliana is not as good. You know, your your merciless execution or whatever. You know, you have insurance against these sort of edict type effects. And so this is a really great way around that. Where normally if you're playing a lot of creatures, fine, bounce that thing and then get rid of that thing. You only have one creature left. And so um, I love this. Again, there's just so many ways to use this, so many ways to deal with things. Um, and this was a, a big favorite of mine in that format. And I just, I just love it. This was my number 10. Uh, I loved Far and Away. I like, first of all, the movie's pretty sweet. I've seen the movie. <laughs> uh, we, we, gotta, we keep bringing up these movies. Aww. It's weird. Isn't that the Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look at you. All right. So far away, super cool card in of itself. Again, this was the, they're talking about fuse. They're showing these awesome fuse cards. This was a terrific card. Saw a ton of play. One of those where you're paying a little bit extra, but you're getting so much versatility that you don't really care. Yeah. Uh, far and away, it was fan freaking fantastic. I loved it. It's on my list for a reason. And I enjoyed fuse for what it's worth. I mean, yes. I love Fuse. I think that Fuse, it's 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 tougher to balance split cards when you give them Fuse because then it becomes three spells instead of two. Right. Um, but you're right. I, I think Far and Away is great. This close to winning a Pro Tour. Uh, but of course, Craig Wesco won Pro Tour Dragon's Maze, uh, defeating Esper Control in the finals. Uh, definitely an excellent, excellent card. All right. Let's move on here to our number one. Aaron, what is your number one? My number one is made up of two colors that most people don't normally think of when they think of me. There's no black here. It has nothing to do with graveyards. You're probably wondering why this is here. But I gained a new appreciation from this, for this card, particularly in Legacy. Um, the Graveyard Hate in Legacy is very, it's on one of two extremes. Either they're running Surgicals or they're running Leyline. It's like, no one's really running Crypts. No one's really running Spell Bombs. And Surgical, I could really care less about. Um, but a Leyline could be a problem for me. And the people who typically run Leylines in Legacy also run Chalice of the Void. And so normally you would run Nature's Claims and Call of the Day. But if they happen to have a Leyline and a Chalice on one, you might as well just scoop. Um, and one of the neat things about Fuse and Splits and Aftermaths is the way that it kind of plays with the rules a little bit. And one of the neat things about this card in particular is that while there is a half of the card that does cost one, um, if they play a Chalice for one, you're, it doesn't matter. Your card can still get around that. And so this is a card that a lot of the Dredge folks in Legacy sometimes run if we feel that we're running into a very Chalice-heavy metagame. Um, and so this is a card I've used before. I have destroyed many Ley Lines of the Void with this. Uh, my number one is Wear and Tear. Um, so so where is an instant for one and a red? You can destroy an artifact. All right, fine. If I have to destroy a cage, I can. Or a trinosphere, it's fine. Um, but tear is what we're really here for. So tear is an instant. It costs one blue, and you can destroy target enchantment, which is what we're really here for. This is a card that's main deckable in miracles. Um, you know, if you're facing other decks, it's fine. The Stoneforge is a thing in Legacy. Um, this is a card that is very rarely ever dead. It can destroy counterbalances. Um, you happen to come up against the weird, the odd enchantress decks. This is a card that I have used in my sideboard to great effect this is a card that i've seen people main deck it's just such a wonderful card and um and, and the art is great too you just have to yeah. <laughs> just smashing someone um and and i love it yeah this, this was is, yeah go ahead oh was this your number six this was my number six oh. very nice because this was my number two <laughs> I, nice. I love me some wear and tear i think this card yes. is terrific i think it's the and perfect while, casting while it, it did primarily see play in primarily blue decks this is a red and white card yeah, I mean, but ultimately the idea that you have essentially you have shatter and you have demystify and yep. you can pay both to get both or you can get either of those cards. This, this to me is the best fuse card because it's the most 
elegant. It's just a beautiful design. Like, all right, we're going to have split cards that you can both play together. All right, here's this classic card essentially from Alpha. Here's this classic card, I think, from Alpha. And you just stick them together. And now you can play both of them if you want. I think especially if you're playing a deck like Affinity or like Dredge, where you often have to play this guessing game of what is my opponent going to have? Where it's right. like, you know, are they going to have Ancient Grudge? Or are they going to have Stony Silence? Or are they going to have you know, suppression field, are they going to have rest in peace? Are they going to have whatever, you know? And so a lot of times you can find yourself on the wrong end if you brought in the wrong card. But when you have something like this, you're ready for anything, which is really what a deck like that wants to be. Yeah, I just, the, the elegance on this just kills me. I mean, every time I'm just like, oh, it, it does, it's perfect. I think it's just a perfect design for fuse this is the perfect design this is the best design in my opinion of fuse yeah, absolutely I, right. I really like this card quite a bit um really popular in old in legacy when miracles was so popular because mm -hmm. they had a lot of artifacts and enchantments that you needed to deal with uh still to this day seeing play in the mentor decks in vintage as well nice all right ruben what's your number one my number one uh is going to make evan mad because to, for my money there is no card, no split card I would rather have, and it's the only split card I've ever seen in most cubes. Okay. Which is, uh, it's in fact five cards on one card. Oh my God, seriously? <laughs> it is who, what, when, where, why. So who, what, when, where, why is uh, a, a split card from the Unhinged expansion. Oh boy. Uh, it, it is a rare. Uh, and it ha uh, who is X and a white target player gains X life, three mana destroy target artifact, three mana counter target creature spell, two mana destroy target enchantment, four mana destroy target land. On the black um, spell. Uh, on a black spell. Yeah, that was that was a little bizarre. But uh, but yeah, you can. Uh, the, the best part about this for me is you can, in fact, stick this on an Isochron Scepter oh and God. choose any of the options, uh, which is a ton of fun. Um it, I just have very fond memories. And if we're talking utility, if we're talking, what are, what is the most that you can do with a split card? What's the splittiest split the card you can do? What's the done. splittiest split card? This is the splittiest split card. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, this is fine. It, it's one of those, like how there's no more split cards than this one, like the, on the single yeah. card. There's been no more five literal it, cards by itself. It splits uh, the most. Uh, yeah. I mean, who is the white? What is the red? When is the blue? Where is the black? And green is the Y. Um, yeah. And it does a bunch of things that are overcosted, but yeah, you put them all together. And if you get it on Isochron Scepter in your cube, you just start right, destroying exactly. lands. It's it gives great. you a ton of options and it's just a, it's just a fun card. And I yeah, like it. That's neat. All right, cool. Well, uh, my number one is clearly your number two. Oh, boy. My number one is the first card that I... Usually what happens with some of these lists is they'll be like, you know, there'll be something that's... Boom, that's it. That's my number one. We're mm -hmm. starting there. That's level zero. And then we'll figure out whatever number two through ten is. Uh, and this was definitely that card. This was the card that basically introduced not only myself, but every, every other Magic player to split cards. I wasn't there when it came out, so I only got to see it later. Um, when, uh, in, when I was playing in like extended and it, which was, was weird, but they had Isochron scepters and they had this card on it, which was also really awesome. Right. And it's also a really terrific design. This is one of the first designs they ever had. This is one of the best blank and blank they've ever made. And when I think of split cards and someone says there's a magic split card, you know, what is a magic split card? And I show them fire and ice. Fire and Ice came originally yep. from Apocalypse. Yes. It is fantastic. Fire is a red and a generic mana for an uncommon instant. It deals two damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures or players. And Ice is a blue and a generic mana to tap target permanent and draw a card. Permanent, ladies and gentlemen. Back in the day, you could shut down their lands. Yeah. That's the thing you could do. During, their, during their upkeep, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, this one, of course, was my number two. Um, certainly deserving. I mean, it, it uh, was a Pro Tour champion. Once again, Kai Bude took tricks uh, and used Fire Ice to great effect with Illusions of Grandeur and Donate as well. Um, just one of the most iconic split cards ever and has continued to have impact in every format that it was ever. I saw it at Vintage the other day. I, I went to look at someone's hand and I was like, I was, I think I was streaming in fact, and I had to do the, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I saw the, the Moto hand reveal and I was like, all right, you know, Tezzeret Vault. <laughs> and I was like, is that a, is that a hand? Mm. Okay. like yeah it just shows up in the darnest places <laughs> um, and of course 
Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, it was recently reprinted in Ultimate Masters. There you go. Which is great. And it reprinted as a common, and so mm-hmm. it breathed new life into Popper. Popper, yeah. Yes, we finally got Fire and Ice as a common. That is really, really sweet. Um, but, you know, again, this to me is the, the, the cherry on the split card Sunday is right at the beginning. They had an amazing idea. They executed it. It was nice and clean. And yep. it's still a beautiful, awesome magic card. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was our top 10 split cards. You'll see them on the screen now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10. And we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. Get those in soon as we record a new episode just a few days after this one. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. And thank you to our listeners for being so patient. We didn't mean to worry you all. Absolutely. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I am uh, got to go, though. I, I really got to split. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Jeez. As we go to our final uh, slide, I want to thank our hey, sponsor. Hey, Evan. Hey, Evan. Make like a banana and end the show. Okay. Wow. They are now seeing the aftermath of your jokes. I hope you're happy. Oh, my well. goodness. Wow. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsors, CardHoarder.com and Cardamajigs.com, presenting Cuba Majigs. My co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler, you guys for watching and listening, and I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics, because it gets crazy up on the pre-show. So crazy. It's an saying. offer that you can't refuse. <laughs> God. Oh. Jeez. That one hurt like. coming out. That one hurt coming out. <laughs> Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at twitch.tv at Magic Mike's on Twitter at Magic Mike's Cast or Magic Mike's subreddit and like the Magic Mike's page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mike's Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio only podcast at Magic Mike's Podcast.libsyn.com or find us on iTunes and Spotify or join us here next week. Same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mike's. Good night, everybody. <laughs>